Welcome everybody. Welcome to uh, this evening's presentation, When Are You Dead? Brain, Dead and Brain Death and Organ Donation. I'm Sally Titterman. I'm the State Medical Director for Donate Life in South Australia. And that's part of a national network of uh, agencies and me medical and nursing staff. And there's one of us in each state and territory. Donate Life nationally and in each state and territory has the job of putting in place the best practice and the best approach to achieve a significant and long-lasting increase in the number of life-saving and life-transforming transplants for Australians. The work of the network is managed through the Organ and Tissue Authority based in Canberra and that was established on the 1st of January 2009 as part of a national reform package. The aim of the Commonwealth's funded 151 million national reform package was to establish Australia on the world stage as a world leader in organ and tissue donation and transplantation. Since 2009, the Donate Life Network has been involved in a dedicated national effort to make improvements to the systems and there is good progress. Organ and tissue donation rates and the number of transplants are increasing. Tonight I'll be introducing you to a panel of experts, two of whom I have sitting with me here, Stephen Orr, who is one of our organ donor coordinators, so a senior ICU nurse who works coordinating organ donations, and Dr Stuart Moody, an ICU consultant who works at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital and also at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. So this panel will have uh, some other members of the panel as well and we are going to be talking about a situation that most people don't even want to think about and it's really the possibility that you or someone close to you will become seriously ill or injured and end up in hospital and intensive care. So serious is the situation that we're discussing tonight that brain death will be diagnosed and organ donation a real consideration. But how did we get to this place? Tonight we'll be using a real case study to talk about the process of brain death and organ donation. There'll be time for questions throughout the event. Before we begin, I'd really like to clarify that the focus of our discussion is the donation of solid organs, not tissues. So solid organs are heart, liver, lungs, kidneys and pancreas, whereas tissue uh, we refer to tissue and it covers eyes, heart valves, bone and skin. So we're only concentrating tonight on the solid organs. Also it's important to clarify that there are two ways to certify death, cardiac death and brain death. And we're focusing just on brain death tonight. Before we start, I'd like to put the uh, story of organ donation in context. And I'll do that by firstly stepping through a slide that really gives the bigger picture. So according to the ADS 2010, Australia had 22 million people. That then relates to the fact that we have about 145,000 deaths in Australia a year. It's gone too fast. It skipped, sorry. That then gives us about 78,000 deaths in hospital a year. So we've gone from a population of 22 million, 145,000 deaths, 78,000 of those deaths are actually in hospital. Now, to be an organ donor, you have to be recognised as a potential donor and you have to be confirmed brain dead or you have to be confirmed cardiac death. And so you also need to meet some criteria that make you be medically suitable or not. And so of that 78,000 that die in hospital, only 790 people qualify to be a potential donor. So that's 1%. So you can see the pool of potential donors has diminished. When we actually get to the number of donors, it then drops again. Last year there were 309 organ donors out of 790 potentials. And we'll be going into the reasons for why we get that drop off, why there is that attrition between the 790 and the 309. And then from the donors, we move to the transplant recipients. We usually see about four organs per donor. And last year, there were 916 recipients of organs. 
So that's the bigger picture. So just to reiterate, only 1% of deaths in hospital give rise to potential donors. In 2010, there were 790 potential donors. If we just go back to the step, potential donors to actual donors, so potential donors to actual donors, we can break that down further. Out of those potentials, there were 664 requests to families for confirmation of organ donation. There were seven, 379 consents, so we've dropped from 664 requests to families to 379 consents, and ultimately, again, there's another drop, and there were 309 donors. If we go then again to the final step, I mentioned transplant recipients. There were 931 recipients of 978 organs across Australia last year. Okay, so we're now going to move to the actual case study. The case study we'll be using tonight concerns a 40-year-old male who had complained of a headache. It increased in severity over the day. That evening, the man became unconscious at home, witnessed by his wife. An ambulance was called and he was taken to hospital where his conscious state deteriorated further and he required mechanical ventilation. A CAT scan of his head showed a large area of bleeding between the brain and the thin tissues that cover the brain. There is extensive swelling in the brain. Due to the extent of the bleed, neurosurgical intervention was not a treatment option. After the CAT scan, the patient was transferred from the emergency department to intensive care for ongoing medical management. The senior intensive care consultant caring for the patient had several meetings with the family to discuss the poor outlook related to the severity of the swelling of the brain that had occurred following the bleed. Due to the severity of the bleed and poor prognosis, the family themselves raised the option of organ donation with medical and nursing staff. This discussion was deferred because the patient was still being actively managed. His neurological condition continued to deteriorate and brain death was confirmed 24 hours after admission. After confirmation of brain death, the fact of death was conveyed to the family and support provided. <coughs> when the family clearly understood that their loved one was dead, the ICU consultant spoke with the family about the possibility of organ donation that the family <coughs> themselves had raised earlier. So we've got the 40-year-old male, headache of increasing severity, unconscious, taken to hospital by ambulance, extensive bleeding, neurosurgical intervention not an option, transferred to the intensive care, diagnosis of brain death, family discussion around the possibility of organ donation. At this stage, I'd like to now open this up to the panel, and I'd like to firstly ask Stuart, what actually is brain death? Um, thanks, Sally. Uh, easy one to start off with. Um, I'll take that, yeah. I think probably the best place to start is with the, the legal definition of death. And uh, as Sally said, there's two ways you can die. But a brain death definition is the irreversible cessation of all function of the brain of the person. Okay? So there's two things there. There's the irreversibility, the permanency of death, and there's loss of all function of the brain of the person. So they also described uh, in the legislation what they meant by uh, all function of the brain of the person. And what they said was that that person would never again experience uh, consciousness, uh, emotions, uh, knowledge, thought, feeling, sensation, uh, speech, and hearing. Um, so what we have to understand is that these individuals are not severely brain damaged but still alive, like uh, patients in vegetative states or minimally responsive states. They have uh, absence of all function of the brain. Um, the second thing that, they, we, that you need to have is, is permanency or irreversibility. And that ties up more with uh, how brain death evolved, which started back in the 1950s, really, with the, the use of mechanical ventilators in intensive care units. Uh, up until that point, patients weren't ventilated. So when an individual had a catastrophic brain injury that would have resulted in brain death, 
they would have uh, immediately stopped breathing, become hypoxic, and their heart would have stopped. So there was no requirement for, for a brain death uh, definition. What, what the practitioners found um, around that time was there was a group of patients that were on mechanical ventilation who showed uh, no function at all of their brain. And, and they looked at these individuals, and what they noted was that there was no recovery from that point. Once there was loss of function, there was no recovery. And inevitably, these patients present, progressed to cardiac arrest, with normally within days to weeks. Um, and they described these patients as beyond coma. Um, and there was a paper around that time that was published uh, discussing that. We, we also know from, from looking at uh, countries where they haven't adopted the brain death standard until recently, and, and an example of that is Japan, where they have continued to ventilate uh, patients that we would recognize as brain dead uh, beyond that point. And they have also experienced that once, that once they've had an individual lose all brain function, uh, there is no restoration of that function and the inevitability of progressing to uh, uh, cessation of heartbeat. So th those two facts then are, are tied together. And, and the other thing to say is that there's never been a documented case in the literature of any individual meeting the criteria and preconditions of brain death and then having any recovery of brain function. So Stuart, why is it that some people and families struggle with the concept of brain death? In your experience, why is that? Um, I think that's, the reason for that is that a, a brain dead patient looks very similar to um, a lot of other patients in hospital. It looks it's the same as somebody uh, about to have surgery. Um, they're on a mechanical ventilator, their chest will go up and down, uh, their heart is still beating, they are warm to touch, uh, and they're pink and perfused. So to uh, an untrained eye, they, they, uh, they seem alive, but there is absolute loss, uh, complete loss of all function of the brain. Um, and it's, it's really trying to understand where the essence of life is. And as a, an experiment to the audience, I guess, is, is if we could, um, if you could be part of some sort of Hollywood movie where you could transplant your brain into another body um, and leaving your body um, behind, but that body was being maintained on machines. Um, where would your life be? W would, would you be alive again in, in, that, uh, in that brain with that uh, new body? Or would your old body be alive? We, we know that life is indivisible, or, or advanced uh, uh, life is indivisible. And I think what we, what we, find, what we feel is that the, the essence of life is, is within the brain, and, and, and that's where we are. Um, the second thing is, is that people say, well, how can you have a dead brain but a, a, a body that's functioning? Because the organs still function. Obviously, they, they go on to be organ donors. So the heart is still working, the liver is still working, they're still absorbing nutrients despite the brain being dead. Um, and th there's examples in the literature of, 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 uh, of women who've, who've carried babies um, when they're brain dead, uh, carry fetuses to term and delivered. And how can that happen? Um, I think the answer to that is, is that cell death is, is, has never been a part of death. Um, we're all going to die, and when we die, our, our fingernails, our hair, and our skin will, will continue to grow for, for days and weeks after we are clearly dead and, and buried. Um, it's also a fact that in, in research labs around the world, there's, um, there's uh, human cell lines, which, which um, uh, are traced back to a lady uh, called Henrietta Lacks, who died in 1951. And, and her cells are continue to be used all around the world for medical research purposes, and those cells divide, and then continue to divide. And those cells have been described as immortal. And, and in a way, the cells are immortal. They will continue to uh, proliferate. Uh, but Henrietta died in 1951. So um, it's, it's separating uh, cell death and, 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 and the brain, which is the essence of who we are. So, Stuart, why do we need to diagnose brain death at all? Um, it, it's two reasons, really, and, and these were reasons that they, 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 which drove it in the 1950s, um, was that it was the ability to convey certainty to the family, to convey the certainty that this individual had died, and that it wasn't about withdrawing treatment or, or, or letting somebody go. The fact of death had occurred, and it was important to get that across to the family. Um, the, the second reason is, is the opportunity for organ donation. Um, the, the, rule, the first rule of organ donation is that to be a, a cadaveric donor, you have to be dead. It's called the dead donor rule. Um, we can't have a system where doctors go around intensive care units uh, looking at uh, 
looking at sick patients, going, ah, oh, you know, he's, he's looking pretty ropey, but <laughs> good set of kidneys, we can maybe use them better upstairs for the patient on dialysis, or, you know, he's had a good innings, we can take that from him. That cannot happen, so the patient has to be dead. So that is the reason we need to diagnose brain death and, uh, and do it properly and uh, completely. Well, if that's the case, there must be some pretty strict criteria around the diagnosis of brain death. Can you talk us through that? Yeah. Um, in Australia, um, the peak body which represents intensive care is, is ANZICS, the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society, and, and they, they give us a statement uh, which is uh, consistent with the international guidelines, and most countries have similar guidelines. Um, it's a comprehensive document, about 66 pages, and it, it takes the intensivist through how to diagnose brain death in, in somebody they suspect that brain death is present. So um, this is the form that we have to look at. You can see on the screen, you probably can't read it, but um, the, the first and probably most important thing is the intensivist needs to know the cause of the irreversible loss of consciousness, needs to know the cause of brain death, um, and it needs to be something that is consistent to progression to brain death, and it needs, to be, it needs to be affecting the whole brain, and it cannot be localized just to the brain stem, because the brain stem is the only bit we can examine clinically. Okay? The second thing is there need to be a period of observation, okay, and that period of observation is four hours, um, and, 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 that, and that is to, to prove irreversibility. Um, and then we need to exclude the preconditions. Now, the, the preconditions are essentially things that could possibly mimic brain death, so we need to be sure that they are not present, and that would be things, and, and they're there on the screen, so somebody has to be warm, because hypothermia can mimic brain death, uh, so the patient has to be over 35, they need to have adequate blood pressure, systolic above uh, 60, sorry, a MAP above 60 or systolic above 90. You need to exclude sedative drugs, um, so they can't be on any sedatives. Uh, normal electrolytes, normal neuromuscular function, they can't have been given paralyzing agents. If they have, a reversal agent is, is needed. Um, you need to be able to examine the, the, the patient, and you need to examine the cranial nerves, which is uh, what we're going to talk about shortly. And then you need to perform an apnea test, and that's the test to prove that there is no uh, uh, breathing, the patient cannot breathe uh, by themselves. So, after we've excluded those preconditions, we then go on to perform the clinical examination. Um, and the clinical examination is, is listed there where we go through the patient is unresponsive, um, there's no response to pain, and uh, there's no pupillary response, no corneal response, no gag, no cough, no vestibular ocular, and the patient's apneic, as in not breathing. And we're going to go through each of one of these with a video, so that's why I've sort of rushed through them. So the first one is that there's no response, uh, no response to pain. So um, this is a, a reaction. So this is a girl who's getting pressure over a superorbital nerve, uh, which is very painful and stimulating, and then she reacts to that, um, and, and that would exclude the diagnosis of brain death. Okay, in a brain dead patient, there will be no facial movement, there will be no uh, cognition of the pain. We also do that in all four limbs, okay, to check that there is no facial grimacing or movement of the limbs. Um, and that confirms the patient is in coma, okay, unresponsive coma, okay, at that point. Um, the next test is we, we start examining the cranial nerves. Uh, this is the pupillary uh, response to light, which uh, tests the uh, second and third cranial nerves. So light is shining in the eye. Uh, the, the, uh, the one on the left there shows no response, and the one on the right shows the constriction with, uh, with, with the light. These pupils need to be at least four millimeters, so they need to be fixed and, and dilated, okay? The next one is the corneal reflex, or the blink reflex, okay? Quite a stimulating <coughs> test. Uh, this stimulates the fifth and seventh cranial nerves, and as you can see there, in a brain-dead patient, there is no blink response, but in, a, in an awake patient or in a patient who has got uh, cranial nerve activity, they blink. There's the, then we go on to the gag reflex, which tests the ninth and 10th cranial nerves, okay? Um, it's done a little bit different in, in, in clinical practice. We wouldn't have the tracheostomy, the patient would be intubated, and we often use a lingoscope, but it's a, a touch to the posterior pharyngeal wall and, uh, and see if they gag as she does there. So these would all exclude the diagnosis of brain death, okay? Um, and then the, sorry, uh, the cough reflex. We stimulate the carina with a, um, with, with a cuff, and as you can see there, that's a very uh, stimulating uh, test and, and everyone would cough uh, even if they're in a, a fairly deep coma. But if you're brain dead, there will be no cough to that. Um, the final test is the vestibular ocular reflex. Uh, that tests the vagus, the 10th cranial nerve. 
uh, and the vesicular orbicular reflex is, is 50 mils of cold water, ice cold water, into your inner ear, and that uh, causes a con uh, circulation within your um, semicircular canals, and then that will cause your eyes to move um, in a nystagmus sort of way um, if you are not brain dead, as in there is cranial nerve activity. Um, that tests the uh, third, fourth, uh, sixth and eighth cranial nerves. Okay, so they're all the cranial nerves that we can test. If there is, if it's absent response to all of those, then we proceed on to the apnea test, which we, we don't have a, uh, we'll go, we'll leave that on there. Um, we don't have an example of the apnea test. Uh, the apnea test is, is to prove that they are, there's absence of breathing. Okay, so what we do is we pre the patient um, and then disconnecting from the ventilator, exposing their abdomen and chest, looking for any respiratory movement, and then wait for their carbon dioxide level to rise to a CO2 of 60 or a pH of less than 7.3, which is a maximal respiratory stimulus, looking for any respiratory effort. It normally takes about five to 10 minutes for that to occur, so they're apneic for five to 10 minutes. If there's any desaturation, we put them back on the ventilator. Um, once all of those tests have been completed and confirmed that there is no breathing and no response to any of those, having met the preconditions, and that doctor will then sign the form and say, in my view, this person has satisfied conditions for brain death. So, so just to recap, when is the actual death? When is the time of death once you've been through all of those tests? Um, it's, the legislation, uh, for good reasons, has a, a second doctor perform uh, a repeat examination. So a second doctor performs exactly the same tests um, and the legal time of death is when the second doctor has completed those tests. So that will be when determination of death has occurred. We recognise that death has occurred in the preceding hours, but uh, actual determination of death is, is the time of that second set of tests. So there's two doctors doing an identical exam. Okay, and I mean, those tests look like they could be fairly um, confronting for family. Do a family present mm. when this happens? Um, w w you know, my practice is I do offer it to the family for the second set of tests. Um, anecdotally, a lot of families, um, it, it, adds, it adds reality to the, the, the concept of brain death, particularly when they see their loved one not breathing. Um, and, and I think then they find acceptance of brain death slightly easier. If they don't want to come, obviously we wouldn't push that, but I do, I do have it as an offer. And does this take a long time, all of this? I mean, what's the sort of time period of of this observation and testing? Um, the testing itself is fairly, fairly rapid. It can be done in sort of five to ten minutes. But there is a four-hour period of observation at the start where we need to confirm um, that this is a continuous period of, of, uh, of apnea and fixed dilated pupils. So that four-hour period starts from when the nurse would, would, would say to us, well, the pupils are now fixed and dilated, the patient has stopped breathing and they have stopped coughing. And at that point, we would say, well, they have likely progressed to brain death because we, we know what the uh, initial diagnosis was. Um, that's sl changed slightly if the insult was a hypoxic ischemic injury. That's a, an injury where there's lack of oxygen to the brain. We extend that period to 24 hours. Of observation. Of observation, yeah. Only because there has been some dubious case reports of a return in function within a shorter t time period. Um, so these guidelines are heard on the side of safety. So it's quite a, a long period we're looking at, four hours, five, mm. six, up to 24 hours sometimes. Mm. Yeah. And what happens next? Once, once you've got through that period of testing, what happens next? Um, once, once that patient's been diagnosed as, as brain dead, then the priority then is really to explain that fact to the family and, and to, to look after that family at what is, is, is clearly an emotive and difficult time for them. So our role then sort of goes into explaining the fact of death and, and making sure they understand that fact of death because it, it, it's important, particularly as the patient still looks pink, warm, perfused and, and, and chest going up and down. And when we were talking earlier, we saw that dis distinguishing a patient to be a, a medically suitable patient is, is very important. At what stage do you come to the decision or the the discussion around medical suitability, i.e. is this patient a possible organ donor? donor? Um, I think that's something that the intensivist will be aware of. We, we never look at, at a patient with a severe brain injury when they arrive as a potential donor. We're clearly always acting in their best interest to try and reverse this terrible pathology. But, you know, as all patients, uh, in all patients who come to intensive care, there is a high risk of, of them dying. And, and if they're dying with a catastrophic brain injury, um, then there is a possibility for them to be an organ donor. Um, 
So we, we would raise the, the option of organ donation with the family once they've understood the fact of death, um, which, which can be a decoupled conversation. But often, as in this example, families now often understand the option of donation prior to that and they will approach us about it. And what about the register, the um, Australian Organ Donor Register that we've got mm. up here? How does that play into to this situation? Um, yeah, that's the, the AODR there on, on, on the screen. Um, th that's an intent register, which um, variably we, we can offer to, to, to use and look on. It will always be accessed <coughs> in, a, in a patient who has, uh, who has been certified uh, brain dead. Okay? Uh, we will, as an intensivist, I will discuss with the family um, after explaining that, that they have died um, that there is an option to be an organ donor and then we will say somebody will be accessing the register to see if they'd uh, offered an intent. Generally the family would know the wishes of the loved one and, and, and the main use that I see for the register is that when the family are uncertain about what the wishes would be we can then say to them well if you're unsure what we can do is check the register um, but, but often they will know and they will come to us and say look he's always wanted to be an organ donor. Uh, so it is a useful uh, um, device in some circumstances. And do families know that their loved one might be on the register, some of them? Um, that's, that's part of the campaign, obviously, that Donate Life are running, is, is that uh, people communicate that wish and, and that uh, the final decision will be a question to the family. Um, and we do encourage that they discuss that they have been registered on the register. But some may not, and if they do, then they... Uh, then obviously that's information they can use to make that final decision. And just stepping back a step, um, I note you use the term mechanical ventilation. In the newspaper today I see life support. Mm. Perhaps, Steve, you could tell us about those terms and why there's some confusion or there are two terms for one thing. <coughs> Thanks, Sally. Yeah, there, are, there are a number of terms that, uh, that, we, that we know exist in, in uh, the community in relation to organ donation, one of them, uh, and um, certainly within intensive care, one of them is mechanical, uh, one of them I should say is life support, and we see that sort of bandied about in the press quite freely. That's a term we try to discourage within the organ donation sector because as uh, Stuart was talking about before, often it's a hard concept for families to grasp uh, that their, their loved one is, um, is brain dead when they're actually pink and warm and the chest is moving up and down. So we, we see that as really an ambiguous statement by uh, suggesting that it's life support because that um, sort of points to the fact that they may not be dead if we're actually supporting their life. So we invariably use the term mechanical ventilation. There's a whole host of different um, terms that, uh, that, that come up um, that we try to discourage as well. One of them is uh, organ harvest, which you often see in the press. And we, uh, we, we try to use the terms such as organ retrieval and um, uh, procurement. Procurement. Yeah. procurement sorry. Um, and one of the, one of the other uh, terms that we try and, and, and discourage is the terms such as passed away because we really want to try and reinforce to the person that their loved one has in fact died. And um, given the, uh, with some people, the difficulty with them grasping this concept, um, uh, terms such as passed away really uh, have a negative in impact on them. And your role as an organ donor coordinator, you'd have to be careful about these terms and, and explain them to families and those sorts of things. But can you tell me, as an organ donor coordinator, what actually, when do you get involved? Well, Stuart went through the process that he's involved in uh, before, and uh, the intensivists spend a considerable amount of time with uh, families trying to get them to a point where they're more accepting of the fact that their family member has, uh, has in fact died. Once he's, dis well, Stuart, one of his colleagues, have discussed the whole issue of organ donation and it's something that the family want to explore further or are keen to progress, then uh, the uh, intensivist within the hospital will normally call our agency. Just to put that in a bit of context, um, our agency has probably about 6.5 FTEs of organ donor coordinators in this state um, and we service the five main hos large hospitals within Adelaide. Um, there's two of us on call 24 hours a day, every day of the year, so there's always somebody at the end of the phone if uh, intensive care units want to actually contact us for the purpose of organ donation or just to get some advice. So uh, generally that's the point where we'll be, we'll be called in to, uh, to, to, to talk to the family and uh, take the process from there. And then you get called in. Could you explain to us what the actual role of the coordinator is and, and how it all gets pulled together? Sure. 
I've just, uh, <coughs> this diagram here um, really sh encapsulates the whole process. And I'm just going to briefly talk through this. If you look at, uh, in the middle of this diagram, so central to the whole process is the actual donor themselves. Um, there's a whole lot of uh, logistical, legal issues um, that we have to look at, clinical issues, and we're really seeing the nexus between the, uh, the donor and, um, and the, these other parts of the process. So initially when we're called in, the first point of call will be talked to the, the intensivist sent to the bedside nurse to get a sort of a, a, a picture of, uh, of the uh, patient's um, progress to date, their family situation, and, and a whole lot of other issues. As you can imagine, this is a fairly complex logistical issue and can take a, uh, a fairly long period of time. In fact, we know that a multi-organ donation in South Australia on average can take up to about 19 and a half hours. So once we've talked to the, uh, the, the intensivist and the nurse, we'll then um, uh, talk to the family and look at their needs and where they want to go and what sort of information they, uh, they require. First and foremost is that um, from our perspective as organ donor coordinators, our process with them is extremely transparent and at all times we've got full disclosure of information. And um, that's very important that we don't go down the track at some, at, 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 um, at some later point the family says, well, you didn't explain to me that it's going to take so long and, and, and that it's just getting emotionally too much and we don't want to, we, we don't want to go on. So uh, we find that um, it's a lot better for the families involved, it's a lot better for the clinicians if, we're, uh, if, if we paint a, um, an accurate picture and have full disclosure from the, from the, the uh, start. If, if the family do want to progress, well, we, we get a uh, formal authority for them to, to proceed and we talk about a whole lot of different issues and that's, that could be... Um, What's, what, which organs they're, they're willing for their, to consent for their family, their family member to uh, donate. Uh, we can look at a whole lot, lot of other issues, whether they want a viewing after the, uh, the, the retrieval surgery. We talk to them about follow-up and support um, because we uh, provide um, um, written follow-up at two and six weeks. We also provide counselling services. Mm -hmm. And often we keep, uh, we, we keep in touch with family over a longer period of time. There's a whole lot of other uh, issues like uh, virology and serology because we want to make sure that there's a lot of transmissible, transmissible diseases that uh, donors don't have and we do this with everyone. Um, we in also uh, take uh, bloods for tissue typing and that's really a, a, a diagnostic blood test to ensure that a donor is compatible with the recipient. Um, we look at uh, all the clinical data and we actually liaise with the transplant units and discuss this clinical data with them. And we arrange um, uh, which uh, organs are going to go where, and that's based on a rotational basis. And um, the uh, kidneys and liver will generally be, um, will go to the clinics here in Adelaide, but thoracic organs will be uh, exported into, into state because we don't have a thoracic uh, clinic here. Um, there's also a, a, a legal aspect with this. We have to ensure that we've got consent from the family or authority. Um, if it's a coroner's case, that we liaise with the coroner and make sure that we've got... Uh, be okay to go ahead. And we also, the final person to sign off on all this is the um, designated officer of the, uh, of, of the hospital. And they're really someone who's there to ensure that procedural correctness has been followed. And uh, they seek a lot of information of the process from us. And um, once they're satisfied that everything has been, uh, has been completed to their level of satisfaction, they'll, they'll give us a go ahead. And um, we, we take it from there. So it's a real matrix, isn't it, in terms of getting all of those things done in the most timely way? It's, it and certainly is. I mean, I sort of look at it. It's um, and it, when when I show you this diagram, it's not it's not really necessarily done in that chronology either, because sometimes you have to keep going back and forward. I sort of liken it to the man that spins the plates. You're always just sort of going back to the beginning and and, and, and continuing to keep those spinning. So it can be a, a quite a complex um, complex task, especially if you've got different clinics within the state and you're, you're dealing with. Um, here, not only here, but the interstate clinics too. So it's really a complex procedure so. in terms of getting it all right. Yep. Just before we go on, Stuart, I'd like to just question about what really determines the suitability for organ donation. I know we've touched on it before, but... Mm. Um, obviously, the, the, the place and how you die, um, the majority of, of organ donors in Australia have to die a brain death, which, as we've already shown, is, is a rare event in, in hospitals. Um, but in terms of absolute exclusion criteria, um, the, the, the four main ones are uh, generally age less than 80. Um, metastatic malignancy, obviously there's a risk of transmission of, of, of cancer, so that's an exclusion. 
um, HIV and any bloodborne diseases. Apart from that, the decision uh, about whether the organ is suitable really comes down to the transplant groups about their need and, and um, assessment of the organ, and there's a, a fair number of relative contraindications depending on uh, the match for the recipient. And Steve, again, just stepping back, I, I know in, in this case study that we're talking about, the process took about 11 hours. What, how long does it usually take? What's the sort of time frame you talk to families about? Um, as I said before, the, the average for a multi-organ donation is generally about 19 and a half or 20 hours. Um, mm -hmm. That may vary if, uh, if it's only organs that are gonna be utilised locally, and uh, that may, that's dependent on a lot of um, factors such as age, condition, medical condition, etc. Um, so uh, in this situation that we're talking about, the, uh, the process from talking to the family to actually getting the theatre took 11 hours, and that's pretty well pretty on par with this, with this sort of scenario. Mm. And Stuart, all of this is going on, the organ donor coordinator is moving all this legal and, and the tissue typing and those sorts of things forward. The donor is still in intensive care. Mm. What's actually happening to the mm. donor? Um, it, at that point, we are, we are still continuing to manage the physiology of that donor. At that point, death has been certified, and it's important then to look after the organs so that this person can be the best organ donor that they can be if that's what they wished. So we, we, the, the medical staff on site, as well as the nursing staff, put a lot of time into optimising the organ function as best they can by making sure the kidneys and inotropes and that there isn't a, uh, a, a failure of the physiology of, of, uh, of, of the organs, which around the time of brain death can be quite complicated because of the changes of the physiology during brain death. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes with the organ donor coordinator and a lot of work yeah. going on still in the intensive care unit to make sure that you maximise It's a very, potential. very busy time for that patient. We always make sure, well, at the big hospitals, a senior nurse goes to that patient, and as the intensive care specialist, I always identify to the registrar the potential issues and what to watch out for. Um, so it is, a, it is a busy time to make sure that they can be the best donor that they can be, because that was their wish um, if the worst did happen, which it, it obviously has. So once we've got to, to the process where all of that's completed or the bits that need to happen, what, how does the actual organ retrieval procedure take place, Steve? Can you just talk us through how that happens? Well, as I mentioned before, Sally, in each hospital a, we, we uh, utilise a, a designated officer who um, can give the, uh, the, the uh, who authorises the removal of, uh, of organs for transplantation. Now, it's important to realise this person is independent of any of the clinics involved and uh, often it may be a, uh, depending on which hospital is, it may be a medical administrator um, mm -hmm. or in some hospitals it may be an intensive care specialist. So um, <coughs> there's a, it's a, they're a very group, but the important thing is that they're independent of the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, as, as Stuart said, the, the, the uh, donor's been maintained within ICU. And once we've arranged that, all the logistics in terms of the clinics that are actually going to uh, carry out the retrieval surgery, um, a time's arranged in the theatre and, uh, and, and we, we take it from there. We, at the time when the patient is then, then is transferred mm -hmm. from intensive care to theatre for the procurement surgery. And this means arranging times that suit interstate teams. You Certainly said before does. that the heart and lung teams come yeah. from interstate. Anybody else come from interstate? Um, the, uh, the, the, the may, I mean, as I said, we, we generally, uh, the, generally the uh, kidneys and liver will be uh, utilised in this state, but that's not to say that uh, other um, states, if it's a, there's a better match or for any number of other reasons, may not uh, occasionally come here to retrieve those organs, but generally it's uh, um, only the, uh, the heart and um, lung team that come from other states. And Steve, I think out of this case study, um, there is a number of organs that actually went to recipients. Can you just talk us through where they went and, and what the outcomes were? We will, if you can see here in the, here in the screen, one thing I just want to point out is that um, normally we, it, it, on average, it'll take about four to six hours to, uh, for the theatre process, depending on which organs are used. And in this case, it took ten and a half hours. The reason for being there that um, if we go through the number of people who received organs, the heart went to a 38-year-old male, the lungs to a 52-year-old male. And you'll see here that the left lobe of the liver went to an eight-year-old female. Now often, um, or sorry, I shouldn't say often, but what can happen uh, occasionally is that the, 
liver will be divided in two, and the smaller left uh, lobe will be used for a child, with the right lobe being used for an adult. And that's what's happened here. And if you look at the fourth dot point, the left kidney and the right lobe of the liver went to a 50-year-old male with both renal and liver failure. And the right kidney to a 62-year-old male with renal failure. And the pancreas ended up being used for research. It had been earmarked for uh, islet cell um, transplantation. And the islet cells are cells within the pancreas that can uh, that, uh, produce insulin. And uh, they can uh, be used to be transplanted into brittle diabetics um, with the hope of uh, getting them off insulin. But uh, as we know from experience, you know, quite a number of, um, of those uh, donations of the pancreas doesn't have enough cells to facilitate that, and often that's used for research, but that is with the, the consent of the, uh, the donor family involved. So this donation was life-saving to five people? To five people. And assisted in research for yes. the final, the islet cells? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, I think... Um, there's been a lot of information that you've just uh, heard and we've, we've worked through there. We're just going to move to the next phase. So um, thank you, Steve. Thanks, thank Stuart. You.